Welcome to Scroll On Air here at the Ohio Media School. I'm Bob McElligot, and I'm going to give you today's presentation. So I want to tell you that I am the radio play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Columbus Blue Jackets of the National Hockey League. Now, it was a long journey for me to get from where I started to the NHL and to climb to what I consider the top of the mountain, to be at the top of my profession. So I'm going to tell you about that journey. And I'm not going to tell you about that journey just so you can hear about everything I did and, and how I did it. But it is for that, but it's for you to go through and figure out what parts of that might work for you. What parts of my experience might be something that you can take that you can tweak, that you can make work for you so that whatever it is that you want to do in this business, that you can find a way to get to the top of your mountain. And I'll tell you this right now before I even start. Perseverance and hard work are going to be two themes of this entire thing because without those two things, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. So let me go through the story. And but well, one last thing before I do. If you have any questions throughout this, you can go into uh, the comment section, the chat section. You can just go ahead and put your question in there. Then when we get to the end, I will answer questions for anybody that's actually here live today or anybody that's watching this online. So I'd love to answer your questions. Whatever it is, they always say there's no such thing as a stupid question. But I think I've asked some stupid questions in interviews. Don't be afraid of asking a stupid question. There is no such thing for you. So just go ahead and put it in the chat, and I'd be glad to answer it when I get done. All right, so my story literally starts at the beginning. And don't look at me and say, boy, if you're going all the way back to your beginning, this is going to be a really long story. I'll shorten it down for you. But I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And only one year old, my parents moved east into the, uh, the mountains in the rural area of western Pennsylvania to a little town called Somerset, Pennsylvania. And I tell you that because that's where I found my love for radio. And it was kind of accidental. We lived up in the mountain. We didn't really have any neighbors that were close by. So when I was younger, I was in grade school. Uh, the way that we got to school was there was a 15-passenger van that would come all the way up around the mountain and pick up the 15 kids that needed to go to school. And the driver of that van listened to the radio every morning. So it wasn't like being on a regular school bus where there was nothing to listen to. And oh, by the way, today you can just pop in your AirPods. It didn't work that way back then. So she used to listen to the radio and she listened to KDKA radio out of Pittsburgh. And every morning from basically seven o'clock to eight o'clock, I would listen to that show while we were driving along. And I thought that those people had the best job in the world because it sounded like they were having the most fun. And they were getting paid for it. And at that time, you know, getting paid for it was not as important as the fun because I was just a kid. But it sounded like it would be just the perfect job to have. So that's how I actually fell in love with radio. And then I would pay attention, especially to the morning shows, because my very first dream was I wanted to be a morning guy. And, uh, and then when I got the chance to be that, I didn't like the hours of it, <laughs> quite frankly. But I wanted to be a morning guy because I wanted to have fun. I wanted to tell the jokes. I wanted to make people laugh. I wanted to do the skits. I wanted to do the voices. And that was really my first dream in this business. Now, on the other side, I love sports. And actually, when I was a kid, I didn't even know how much I loved sports. I mean, you know, we would watch games on TV, baseball games, football games, hockey games. Um, since we lived about an hour outside of Pittsburgh, my dad would take us to a Pirates game maybe a couple of times a summer. Uh, the Steelers game we couldn't go to because they were just sold out all the time. So we didn't go to those. Uh, we'd go to a hockey game maybe once a year. But when it came to playing sports, the way I got into it was almost an accident. I remember being eight years old. And one day my mother said, uh, tonight they have sign-ups for Little League Baseball, and you're going to sign up. And I had no interest. I, I mean, I liked sports, but I, to me, again, not living around any neighbors, only dealing with the, you know, the, I had friends at school, but this was going to be a different kind of group of kids. And, you know, at eight years old, it was intimidating, and I really wasn't into it. And she goes, no, you're going to play baseball. Well, I do thank my mother for pushing me into playing baseball because it turned out to be a really big part of my life. 
Um, when I started to play baseball at that age, it wasn't like it is today. I mean, today, the 8-year-olds play with 8-year-olds and against 8-year-olds. Same with the 9s, the 10s, the 11s. When I played, it was 8 through 13. And then it went to 8 through 12. So it was almost like being in high school. Whereas when you were younger, you didn't get to play very much. And you had to learn from the older players on the team. And then as you got older, you became one of the leaders on the team. But man, I'll tell you what fun we had. I, there were things we did back then that you could never do today, like pack 15 kids in the back of a pickup truck and drive on backcountry roads to go to your game that night, all together. And of course, when you won, it was the greatest ride home ever. It was always the greatest ride there. If you won, it was the greatest ride home ever. If you lost, you'd lose about 10 of those guys that would go back with their parents and you, you wouldn't see them until the next practice. But it was, a, it was a camaraderie. And again, it was something that I wouldn't realize how special it was until later in life. So as I went through school, I played baseball in high school. And really one of my biggest, uh, my first biggest adversities in life was when I was a sophomore in high school and my parents divorced. And it was hard for me because, number one, I guess I was never paying attention. I didn't really see it coming. And then it was my mom that was moving out, and she wanted to take everybody with her. And I wanted to stay with my dad because I wanted to be in that house, and I wanted to be around the friends that, that I had there, and I, I didn't want to go anywhere. So it was, it, was, uh, it was difficult in that way. But what I really lost the most in that was that my dad picked up more work, which meant that he wasn't home as much, which meant that nobody was on top of me about doing my schoolwork doing the homework that I needed to do, getting things done the way I needed to do them. And at that point in my life, quite honestly, I wasn't responsible enough to be making sure of all of that myself. So that would turn out to be a little bit of a problem uh, a short time later, but something I was able to uh, get through. Now, one thing my dad and I had in common was my dad, when he was younger, he wanted to get into radio. And I don't know, maybe I got some of that from him and I didn't even know that I was getting it from him. I, I don't know. But he wanted to be in radio. He had taken a, a brief course, but he never got to finish it because he was young. He went to Vietnam. He came home. He married my mom. Pretty soon right after that, here I came. And pretty much his dream was, was gone at that point. Uh, in that, at that point in time, that's just the way that it was. But he always had that that desire to, to do something like that. And ironically, he got the chance at the same time that I got the chance. Because when I was in high school, there was a kid that was a year in front of me that had his own DJ equipment. It's much different than the DJ equipment that is carried around today. I mean, you didn't take a laptop with every single song on it. Oh, no. You had boxes full of records and tapes and then CDs. You had to graduate as the technology changed. Um, but... So he did the school dances, and I knew he was going to graduate, and he was going to go off to college. So I knew there was an opportunity. I knew there was a chance that maybe I could do a little bit of what I wanted to do. It wasn't a radio job, but it was playing music and you know stuff that I would do at home on my own. I mean, to be completely honest with you, there were times when I used to take, uh, we had two cassette recorders at home, two boom boxes, if you will. And I used to have one that did the main recording and I would play a record on the stereo here and as that song was ending I would start to play a tape over here and I would talk over and and I did that it drove my brother and my sisters crazy who cares if you drive your brothers and sisters crazy I was the oldest so it didn't matter I could do whatever I wanted to right but but I did that so when this DJ thing came up I was interested in doing it and I went to my dad and I said I'd like to do the school dances and what happened was we couldn't really afford the equipment that it was going to take to do that. But he actually brokered a deal with a couple of guys that owned a local bar that uh, basically if they advanced him the money and he went and he bought the equipment, then he would DJ for them for X amount of times until he basically paid it off. So that's how we got the equipment. And then I would do the high school dances on Friday nights, the Saturday nights, and he would play the bar. Now, what ended up happening with my dad is that he turned that into a side business where he did it for a long, long time, and he made money at it. It was good money to supplement his income, but 
what he really did was got to live that piece of his life that he was never able to do back when he was younger. But it was, it, but as I said, it worked out for both of us because that's really how I started. I started doing that. Now, to get back to not doing my schoolwork, this is where that came into play. So I get to be a senior in high school. And I'll be honest with you, because I was born in Pittsburgh, my grandparents lived in Pittsburgh when I was a kid. I used to go down there for weeks at a time, and I loved going to the city. I was a country kid who loved going to the city because all your friends were right next door down the street, right? If you wanted to play football in the street, you could, get, you could have 10 guys like right now, not like where I lived, where you'd have to get on a bicycle and ride for a couple of miles just to be able to do that, and that's true. It's not the uphill both ways to school kind of thing yet, but it could turn into that. But so I love being in the city. So my dream was I wanted to attend the University of Pittsburgh. That is the only place that I wanted to go to school at. And at that time, again, not having the guidance and not knowing what was going on, I just thought you just sign up, you apply, and you're good. Well, obviously, we all know it doesn't work that way. What happened to me was... They came back and they said, because of your grades, you'll have to go to a branch campus. And the branch campus was pretty close to my hometown, and I knew what that was like. It was like nothing. Now, that wasn't exciting. It was a small little school building in a little town, and I didn't want to do that. So I decided I was going to take a year off. I don't know why I decided that. I guess it was just because I didn't know what else to do. There was nowhere else I had thought about going. There was, I really had no plan at that point. So I ended up getting some jobs. I was a busboy at a restaurant during the day. I would work there from 6 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. I would show up at a convenience store at 4 o'clock and work until 10 o'clock at night. You know, a couple of days a week. It was hard to get a day off. I mean, you needed to make money then, right? Wanted to get out of the house. Wanted to live on my own. Had to have money to do that, had to have a car, all the things that we deal with each and every day. Now, our local radio station was, uh, it was an AM-FM combination station. Uh, the AM was actually a big 10,000 watts during the day, which is pretty powerful. But at night, you'd have to power that thing down to about 400 watts, which basically means you can't hear it outside of its own parking lot. And the FM was a 3,000 watt FM, which was, it was good coverage. It covered the entire county. It was locally programmed. I mean, if you wanted to know what was going on, you want the weather, you want to know the local news, had all of that. And, you know, it, the, the programming of it was, it was a mixture. There were some talk shows, there were some sports, there was just about everything you want. Well, they did all the high school sports. I knew from my time in school that they broadcast all the football games and basketball games. So I wanted to get a job there. Didn't know how to do that. While I was working these jobs, I did find a school that's very similar to this school. Well, I say similar, but this is much better. <laughs> With the, uh, the education and the experience here is much better. But this school was called the Columbia School of Broadcasting, and it was in Pittsburgh. What I would do was I would drive to Pittsburgh once a week, and I would meet with uh, an advisor, and I would get an assignment. And then I would go home. They would, they, I had a book full of assignments, so I'd go there, I'd go over the assignment, I would go home with a blank cassette tape, and then I would have to record the assignment. The next week, I would take that tape back to the school, turn it in, talk about the next assignment, get another blank tape, and so on. And that was, that was really the only education of the school. Well, since I was going to that school... I happened to be at the convenience store one day, and in the afternoons on our local radio station, there was this little, um, almost a classifieds program, where after the news, they would come on, and they would talk about, I mean, it literally could be uh, somebody lost their dog, and if you see this dog, call this number, I, literally. Uh, but a lot of it was businesses, businesses that they, they had a sale this weekend, and it would be Businesses that couldn't afford a 30-second commercial or a 60-second commercial, but they could pay $15 to have this live announcement read two times a day. So one day, they were actually advertising that they were looking for part-time help at the radio station. So I thought, well, I'm going to go and try for that. I mean, I'm going to this school, and this is definitely what I want to do. So I'll never forget, I went to the station, 
I walked in, I walked in there, and there were, there were two receptionists uh, sitting there as soon as I walked in. I told them why I was there. They went and they got the program director. He took me back to the studios. He put me in this, uh, he put me in this big studio sitting at a table with a microphone in front of me, gave me a folder with some news stories in it, pulled a couple of them out, set it in front of me, and he said, okay, I want you to read these and do it like you're on the air. And he went into the other room and he started recording and I did what he asked. So when I finished, he came in, he said, okay, just sit here. Um, I got to go talk to somebody and I'll be back. So I waited a few minutes and he came back and he said, uh, our general manager would like to talk to you. Now, in today's world, so many of these stations are owned by big corporate conglomerates, whether it's uh, the iHearts that own, you know, four or five stations in a town. Well, this was just a little locally owned radio station. There were three businessmen in town that got together and bought this and they ran it. And this general manager was one of the owners and he was the one that was there day in and day out. So I went to his office and he said to me, we like what we heard from you. And I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If you come in here for the next six weeks on Wednesday nights from seven to midnight, and if you work for free and train for free, if you are still here at the end of the six weeks, I'll give you a part-time job. That sounded like a deal to me. Again, I had jobs to make money, but this is what I really wanted to do. So I went in and I, and I trained uh, with uh, the guy that worked nights. And at the end of the six weeks, true to his word, he gave me a job. Every Saturday night from 3.30 to midnight, I would go in for the first hour and a half and I would play country music. And then re there were pre-recorded programs that I had to play from 5 o'clock until midnight. And then at the end of the night, I had to do a newscast on both of the stations at the same time and then shut it down. It, it, it shut off at midnight. So I took that job, and that's what I did. But since I had so much downtime, what I would do is I would go into the production studio, and I would, I would practice. I would, take, I would take music, and I would play it, and I would do all those things I did as a kid with uh, the two tape recorders. I would go into a studio, and I would do with the, uh, with the music, and I would record it there, and I wanted to get better at it. So after a while of doing that, they came to me, and they asked me if I'd like to move to Saturday mornings on the FM station from 5 o'clock till 9 o'clock in the morning. And as I told you before, I thought mornings would be a great job until I got that job. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. But, man, you definitely had to be there by 4.30 at the latest. On a Saturday morning, you're talking about a guy that at the time was in his early 20s. Friday night, and then you got to be on the air at 5 o'clock on Saturday morning. Some weekends were a challenge. It was tough. But it was fun because I pretty much did the show however I wanted to do the show. And that was much to the dismay of that general manager and owner sometimes. There were many Saturday mornings where I would do something. Because this was a very conservative radio station. They didn't do anything funny. They didn't do any skits or anything. But I would do that on Saturdays. And I can't tell you how many weeks... It would be, uh, we went into a news block at 8.30 in the morning. And so that's when I was done. I was essentially on from 6 o'clock until 8.30. And he popped in so many Saturday mornings at about 8.40, 8.45, and he would just simply say, hey, um, stop seeing me in my office on your way out, which meant that I did something he didn't like. Well, eventually got to a point where one time he just told me, quite frankly, he said, uh, he goes, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really like to laugh in the morning, which, by the way, I didn't think he ever liked to laugh, just knowing the guy. <laughs> but he said, I don't really like to laugh in the morning, but when I go out and I'm doing sales, a lot of people tell me that they like listening to what you do on Saturdays. So I'm going to let you keep doing it. So that was kind of like the first victory in the business for me. But it was all about sports with me. One of the reasons that I wanted to work at that station was because I wanted to do sports, and I knew they did all the sports. So... Um, but I had to wait my turn. And eventually, there was about six people that said no to doing a high school football game, I guess. And they came to me and they said, hey, we understand you want to do sports. Do you want to do this high school football game? So I did the high school football game. I was doing color. I wasn't the play-by-play -play guy, so it was a little bit out of my element on that. But I did it. I did it with a teacher from the high school that, you know, I, he was teaching when I was going to high school, so that was weird. 
You know, when you're all of a sudden it's somebody that, and he wasn't, truth be told, he wasn't the most likable teacher by any means. But um, it was weird because now I'm working with him as, a, as an equal on the air. And, oh, by the way, I was much better than he was. But <laughs> that, was my, that was my first opportunity. And then the football games kind of came here and there. In the meantime, still working, one of the things I did do is I took a sales job at the radio station. Because, again, I wanted to be in. I was only in part-time. I wasn't there doing what I wanted to do every single day. It was, it was this one day a week I was getting to do it. And I, and I had to wait for that one day a week. I had to go work jobs I really didn't like and I, things I didn't really want to do just to get to that one day. So uh, I took a sales job at the station figuring, well, if I can sell some more stuff, they'll let me do more stuff. Which was a great idea in theory, but I hate doing sales. So, um, but I did that for a while. And, but one day I got a call from the guy that scheduled all the sports. And one of the sports that he did was high school wrestling. So he calls me up and he says, how would you like to do high school wrestling with me this year? Oh, and ironically, the way this opportunity came is his partner. They were both older gentlemen. His partner had a heart attack and wasn't going to be able to work the season. So he said, what do you think? I said, well, I don't know anything about wrestling. I never went to wrestling meets when I was in school. I, I don't know if I'll be much help. He said, listen, I've done enough football with you to know that, that you'll be able to pick up on it. So I agreed to do it. And that was my first regular gig at doing sports play-by-play. -play. And I found it to be so much fun because the, the high school wrestling community is like a family. It didn't matter what school you were at. It was a very niche kind of an audience. And, you know, we, quite frankly, we would go do these wrestling meets and then we would hit the local establishment afterwards and all the parents and the coaches and the principals would all be there. And you got to know a lot of people and it was just a lot of fun being inside those circles. But again, I always had bigger aspirations. I never knew how to get to that next level. How do I, this is all fun. Everything I'm doing is fun. I'm getting to do what I want to do, but how do I get to another level with it? How do I get bigger? I mean, my dream at that time was to do Major League Baseball. I wanted to call games for the Pittsburgh Pirates. That was my dream. How do I get from this small station to that next level? How do I take the next step in achieving my dream? Well, I took another part-time job at a bigger radio station. There were no sports involved. It was a country station. It was in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, 50,000-watt FM station. I got a part-time job there. Right after I got that job, the guy that worked from uh, 7 to midnight got a job in another market, and he left. They took the guy that was working from midnight until 5. They put him in the 7 to midnight, and they asked me if I could work midnight until 5 until they found somebody else. All right, fine. So I did. I took that shift from midnight to 5. And uh, you can imagine, you know, that, that too has its own challenges. I was driving 30 minutes to get there and then working all night and... And I still had to have jobs to make money. By that time, my dad, his full-time job was a maintenance worker at our local church. And uh, I was working with him. So that job was from 8 to 4. So I was working from midnight to 5. And then I would go home briefly. And I would go in and work with him until 4. And then I would go home and try to get something to eat and sleep. And then get back to the radio job at midnight. That lasted three weeks maybe. And the guy that was working 7 to midnight got an opportunity to go to Pittsburgh and work. So now they asked me if I would move from 7 to midnight until they found somebody else. So here I am working in this prime spot, 7 to midnight, part-time wage, and still looking to full-time get into this business. How am I going to get into this business? Uh, one thing that I did a couple of years uh, in a row was I found out about minor league baseball and how it worked. And I found that out actually by accident. Went to uh, Pittsburgh. There was an off-season. The Pirates do this off-season thing for their season ticket holders. And what it really is, I know this now because I'm in the business, what it really is is they bring you together and they bring in some players and they bring in their management people and um, they're trying to sell season tickets, right? They want you to be interested in February so that you come to games in April, May, June, July, August. But one of the things they had there was um, you could pay to do play-by-play. -play. You could watch an old game and call play-by-play -play with one of the actual announcers. And uh, I went two years in a row. The first year I did it, I did it with a former pitcher who was the uh, color analyst. And 
Nothing came out of it. I do remember I came off the stage and just a regular guy in the crowd pulled me on the arm when I got off the stage and he goes, you did a better job than he did for crying out loud. <laughs> well, thanks. It was a nice compliment. It didn't get me anywhere. The next year I went back. Uh, it was one of their play-by-play -play guys that was on the, on the stage with me. And I was disappointed because I wanted to do it with an actual color analyst. I wanted it to be real, as real as it could be. And it wasn't going to be real, and I knew that, but you know what? Hey, I'm still getting to do it. So I get up on this stage, and I'm, doing, I'm calling this with him, and he's not saying anything. Like, very little. And in my mind, I'm thinking, why is this guy not saying anything? Do I suck at this this bad? He's not even saying anything? Because the guy last year told me I was great. But we get done, and he looks at me, and he goes, you're better at this than a lot of guys that are already in the business. He goes, this is what you should be doing for a living. I said, this is what I want to do for a living. This is why I'm here. This is why I've paid to do this, just to get the, the experience of doing it. So he went and he talked to the people there, and he said, if you can come back in an hour, we're going to have Steve Blass here, who is a former pitcher and a color analyst. He goes, I would like you to do this again with him because he's an actual analyst. And he wasn't going to charge me, so great, right? Perfect. So uh, I went and I did that again, and what I got out of it was I got a demo out of it. And I also got, he told me, I got information because he told me how to find jobs in minor league baseball, which I had absolutely no idea how to do. I didn't know at that time there was a directory that you could buy, and it would list every team, and I'm talking about over 120 teams, tell you who their general manager was, uh, tell you if they did radio or if they didn't do radio, the contact information there. I didn't know any of that. So he put me on to that. And the baseball winter meetings, which was the one time every year in December when the major league teams and the minor league teams will go to one city for meetings in a trade show, and they're all there. So you can talk to a lot of people at one time. So uh, I went, I'd gone to the baseball winter meetings a couple times, didn't have anything to show for it, and, uh, you know, was still trying. So one day I was at this country station, and uh, this is before the days of, you know, having a cell phone that had voicemail and all that. So I was at the station, I was working the show, and I decided to call home and check my messages. And uh, lo and behold, I had a message on there from a general manager in Kinston, North Carolina. The Cleveland Indians had a single-A team in Kinston. And he had gotten my stuff from another guy in the league who I had applied with and didn't get the job. But the guy liked my stuff, and he knew this guy had a job opening, and he sent it to him. And so I have a message going, uh, hey, you know, I'd like to talk to you about the job that we have open, which shocked me. It was, I wasn't expecting it. So I, I think that was a Saturday. I think I was working on a Saturday. So I had to wait until Monday to call him back, and I was all anxious all weekend. And, and I called him, and, you know, we did a phone interview, and, and then I had to wait again, right? But I'll never forget, uh, I'll never forget, I was with my dad, I was working with my dad, as I told you. I'll never forget the day the call came at work, where it was this general manager, and he was offering me my first job in professional baseball. And, um, you know, my dad was, it was great that I was there sharing it with my dad, because, as I said, it was a business he wanted to get into, and, and I could tell he was proud. And look, my dad was a tough guy. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot of love growing up, like when you did things wrong. It was, it was more the kick in the butt, not the pat on the back with everything. So that was a special moment for me to be able to share that with him. Well, just prior to that, there's a hockey team in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and they, uh, they had a, a guy that just bought the team, and he was looking to do some new things. He had some new ideas. And one of the ideas he had was to add a mascot. And at that time, I wasn't in sports professionally, and I always thought mascots looked like they were having fun when I went to big league games, so I decided to go and apply for this mascot position. <laughs> the job interview literally was put on a costume, and the, the, the character was a dog. And, uh, and it was a dog because in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, there's an old hockey movie called Slapshot. It was filmed in the mid-'70s. And there is actually a statue of a dog in Johnstown, and the, the fable is that he saved people from the Great Flood. So the statue was in the movie, 
which makes it quickly relevant to hockey. And so the owner's idea was to have a dog for the mascot and call him the Iron Dog. So I put on this dog costume. They took me to the mall at lunchtime, and they said uh, I was with their radio guy and their assistant general manager, and they go, just go interact with people. And that's what I did for 30 minutes, and then I got the job. So I would go there on game nights, and I started with a whopping price of $25 a night. They were paying me to go do that. And very quickly into it, they raised my pay to $30 a night because the owner was so pleased, which was nice. I mean, again, it was just spending money at that time and being able to have fun. But I took that thing to a, I tried to take it to a major league level. I had different costumes made, so I would wear a different costume and every period and do fan interaction. We had, you know, we had, there was a little old lady that would do the chicken dance every night. So I would always go up and do the chicken dance with her. So I would, con I would coordinate that with the organist and say, Hey, make sure we're going to do the chicken dance at the next whistle, but make sure I'm over there. It was, it was crazy. I mean, I was, I was getting a little bit of money to run around and act like a fool and nobody even knew who the fool was because I was masked the entire time. But that was my first opportunity in, in pro sports. And then I got this, this baseball chance. So I had to leave. I left in February and I went to Kinston, didn't even know where it was. At that time, there was no uh, GPS. I had to actually go get a map and plot out my route. And God, I wish there was a GPS because the way I went there the first time, I would never go that way again. <laughs> it was way out of the way. It's one of those things where you're driving there and you're like, what have I gotten myself into? Where am I going? I don't even see civilization in some parts of this drive. <laughs> but um, that was a, it was a great experience, and, and I really turned out to work for a great guy there. And, and I learned a lot. I remember the first time he took me in the press box, and there were, the stats were hanging there from the previous year, and there was a roster, and there were all these transactions, and it was a long, long list because it's low-level baseball, so there are guys that are moving all the time. And uh, he said, yeah, this will be uh, part, of your, part of your stuff to do is media relations. And I thought, how am I going to do all that? I don't even know anything about that. Well, I figured it out as it went along, and it got to be commonplace. But that job was only a seasonal job. It went from April, well, I started in February. So it went from February until September. And then I needed another job. And the owner of the hockey team wanted me to come back and be the mascot again. And I said, listen, I love that job. But I can't work for 30 bucks a night. I have to have a job. He said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll make you the director of group ticket sales. So you come in, you sell tickets, you know, contact groups all day long, groups of 10 or more, try to sell them discounted tickets. And then on game nights, you can be the mascot. So I went there and I worked. There were two other guys uh, in the office with me and then a general manager, uh, like three guys in one room and... It was it was some of the most fun I had. And there are days I look back on that. The, the first year I worked there, we had six sellouts that year, which was a pretty big deal for a really small market team. And I don't know how because I don't remember us ever working. I don't. I remember us screwing around, having fun. But somewhere along the way, we were doing work too. We were getting our job done, and we were selling tickets. But the radio guy that was there at the time, he knew I did minor league baseball, and he had to do some high school hockey games as part of his deal with the radio station. And he said to me, if you want to go with me to these high school games, I will teach you how to broadcast hockey. I knew about hockey, but I'd never broadcast it. He said, I'll teach you how to broadcast hockey. So I went with him, and he started letting me do two periods of the game, and then he would you know, help me out. He would critique me afterwards. You know, tell me what I needed to do better and all that stuff. So that was my first actually working hockey. And then it got to the point where I started to go with him to some of the close games, Wheeling, West Virginia, Erie, Pennsylvania, and I was doing color with him. And we were having a great time. It was, it was fun, and I learned, I learned a lot doing that. Then I finally got uh, a minor league baseball job that was a year-round job. And uh, I went to Wilmington, Delaware. And Wilmington was not a bad place to be whatsoever. It was not far from Philadelphia, probably about 20, 20 to 30 minutes from Philly. The broadcast actually carried into the Philadelphia market, so you had a chance to be heard. Uh, the team was good. The ballpark was pretty new, and it was a great situation. So I got there in the spring of 1996, and like I said, 12-month-a-year job this time. Didn't have to worry about anything else. I didn't think I had to worry about anything else. But here's how it went down. 
that's where I faced real adversity in this business for the first time. And this is where I thought it was over for me at this time. We had a great team, played the entire season, won the championship. At the end of the championship series, the general manager told us all that he was going to take everybody in the front office to Vegas for a weekend. So we went to Vegas for a weekend. He and his wife stayed there for another week. So we went for the weekend, came back. He was still there. I took vacation a week after that. Didn't see this guy for two weeks. First day I got back from vacation, he calls me in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and fires me. Which I was shocked. I didn't see it coming. He wanted more of a sales guy. Um, you know, in the lower levels of professional sports, selling and making money is more important to some people than what the on-air product sounds like. Because, now just because. It all depends who you who it is. And this guy was one of those guys. He didn't feel that I sold enough advertising. And it didn't matter to him what I did on the air because there were a million other people that he could hire. And he thought he could find a better sales guy. So now I was out. And I will never forget that feeling. I thought my career was over. I thought, man, I finally was on this track. And now I'm off the track. And I have no idea what, now what? Where am I going? Well, there was another team in the league that ironically, this guy had worked with previous to me getting into the league. And um, the general manager of that team did not like the guy had just fired me at all. And his radio guy was leaving. So I knew he had a job open. So I called him. I told him what happened. And he ended up hiring me. So I was still in the league. Now I was, it's a six-team league, and I had just worked with three different teams in the league already. But, um, but I went there, and it was great because I was still in. But I knew what I was getting into when I went there. It was the worst ballpark in the league. It was in Northern Virginia, so the traffic was bad. The cost of living was high, and it wasn't, it wasn't great. And it was, it was a drop-off from where I was, and it was very disappointing, and it was hard to deal with at times. The only thing that made it great was the people that I worked with. And I lived with two other guys in a house that had a pool, and then my buddy got a pool table. We didn't have a dining room table. We had a pool table, and I'm telling you, again, when you're in your mid-20s, and you've got an in-ground pool, and you've got a pool table, and... You're living with other guys, and everybody's coming to your house on weekends after the day games on Sundays to cook out and play wiffle ball and swim. It ain't too bad. That part was good. But, but again, it was something where I could already see what was going on. I could see that there were some of the same trends. I figured out why the general manager there didn't like the other general manager. They were very similar. They were similar people. And I could see that, again, I might be falling into a spot here where I'm not selling enough or... And the radio there was even less to worry about because it was on lower, low-powered stations and you couldn't even really hear it. But fortunately, I kind of got a, I got a big break because that hockey team in Johnstown, their radio guy left to move up to the next level and that job was open. So I applied for the job and, um, and I wasn't sure I was going to get it. It was a different general manager, not the guy I'd worked for before. I wasn't sure, but I, I did get it. So... Every time I go out and I talk to, to clubs, you know, like a Kiwanis club or something like that, which I do a lot for my job now, I always tell them when it came to Johnstown, I went from the job where the mascot, you're not allowed to talk, to the radio guy where all you do is talk, right? It's not, the, it's not a normal transition of how you get from one place to another, but it worked for me. So when I went there, I thought I was going to be able to do my minor league baseball there, but it was an independent league. It wasn't affiliated with a major league team, and, and I found out pretty quickly that that was not going to be good. It just didn't. I'd go over and talk to the general manager who had supposedly agreed to hire me for the summer, but I wasn't feeling it, and I got pretty nervous about it. So I called another guy that I knew from the Carolina League where I'd been working before, this time in Salem, Virginia, just outside of Roanoke. And he had a, he had a position open, and I go, look, I don't think this summer thing's going to work out here. So he hired me. So I would get done doing hockey, and I would go down to Salem, and I would do baseball. And again, I'd live with a couple of guys in the office, and, uh, you know, it was great times. It was fun. I was never making much money during all of this. I was making enough to survive, but the fun factor was, you know, it was keeping you going. So two years of that, and there was a job open in Syracuse, New York, in hockey. 
was the next level of hockey. And I told you, I was a baseball guy. I, I thought I was going to be doing Major League Baseball. Hockey was something I did because it was fun. I liked the athletes. Uh, you know, they were fun to be around. The culture was good. It was very family-oriented with the players and the management and everything. I just liked being around those, those players. But it was fun. I didn't see it as what was going to be my ticket. But then this job opens in Syracuse, and I was going to send my stuff there, and, and I knew a guy that was working there, and you know, he told me to send my stuff, and I didn't do it because I was in the middle of a baseball season. And then that guy left, but the job was still open in August. So I called him again. I go, what is going on? Why is that job still open? That job should be filled a long time ago. And he said, well, the, the guy that does the public, uh, public relations travels, and he rooms with the radio guy on the road, and he can't find anybody that he likes. He just is not feeling the vibe with anybody. So I finally sent my stuff. And I ended up talking to this PR director. Part of the job was to work at the radio station that carried the games and do uh, afternoon drive sports. So I had to talk to the PR guy from the team. I had to talk to the program director at the radio station. And very late in August, for a season that starts in early October and training camp that's in September, late in August, I got offered the job. And I didn't, again, I didn't think I was ready. I, I didn't think I was ready to move up in hockey. I felt I was ready to move in baseball, but not in hockey. The opportunity came and I left and I went there and the timing could not have been better because they have a triple A baseball team as well. Same radio station was carrying both teams. One of the, they had two guys doing baseball. One of them had just left. There was an opening and the way it synced up was I ended up doing basically triple A hockey in the winter and triple A baseball in the summertime. Now it didn't leave for a lot of off time. Um, again, when you're young and you're single, you don't care that much, but it was basically 220 games a year. Then you had to do the sports updates. As I was there, I moved from doing the afternoon sports updates to doing the morning updates. Again, morning guy, thought it was going to be fun. Not so much fun when you get done with a ball game at 1130 at night and you've got to be on the air at 515 in the morning. But I paid the bills and it was fun. And now I was just that one step away from uh, where I wanted to be. And then people would start asking me, what do you like better, baseball or hockey? And my joke used to be, whichever one's going to get me to the big leagues first, I don't care. That was only half a joke. Uh, but the, uh, the team in Syracuse, when I got there, they were affiliated with the Vancouver Canucks. But the very next year, the Columbus Blue Jackets were coming into the league, and they had already announced that they were going to be affiliated with the Blue Jackets. So, again, it was the right place, right time for me because I was able to establish some relationships with the broadcasters that were in Columbus, with a broadcast director that was in Columbus. And even a couple of years into my gig, uh, the play-by-play -play guy that was here, his father passed away, he had to miss some games, and they called me and they had me come in and fill in. And, uh, you know, again, those were, those were great opportunities, but when they were over, you never knew if it was going to happen again, right? Uh, I remember the first time I filled in, I did the games I was supposed to do. I was back at the hotel. It was at the Crown Plaza downtown. I think it was a Monday. And um, my coach and assistant coach from Syracuse called me. They said, when are you coming back? I said, I don't know. Nobody said anything to me. They said, well, don't answer your phone. And don't answer any knock on your door. If they can't find you, they can't send you back. Right? They found me. They found me about an hour later, actually. Called and they said, hey, they, we got a flight for you at 4.30 this afternoon, so you know, just get to the airport. So again, you never knew if it was going to happen again. I remember telling my dad one time, you know, we are talking about, as you go through the minor leagues, you, you get to a point where, as I said, you're young and it's fun and, and you don't have a family and you don't have commitments, and then... After years, those things change, and all of a sudden, there's more people you're responsible for. You have a family, and you're making money, but you start to ask yourself, how much longer can I do this? How much longer can I stay here and work for this? Is the break going to come, or isn't it going to come? And I told my dad once upon a time that I'll give it until I'm 40 years old. If I'm not in the big leagues by the time I'm 40, that's it. i got to figure out something else to do. Um, in 2013, my dad got sick out of nowhere. 
uh, right after Christmas. And within five to six weeks, he went from not feeling well to having passed away from melanoma. And it was really hard for me. But I, I'd gone to see him when, when he got really sick. We were actually on our all-star break in Syracuse for hockey. And um, I came back to, to see him. And I felt bad when I had to leave. And I didn't know if I would see him again. And I, you know, we were hoping against hope he was going to be able to find some treatment that he was going to be okay. But I knew well enough. We had a player that was a, that was a cancer doctor out of Minnesota. And I, I talked to him. And, you know, I pretty much knew. We all pretty much knew. And so I, I didn't want to leave. And I felt bad. But, you know, my dad, who was constantly working throughout his life, uh, when I was the last time I was there and I saw him, he just looked at me and he said, "Just go do your job, do your job. That's what you need to do." So, when you know, they make some changes here in Columbus a couple years later, and I'm I'm in the mix to to get a job here. And literally, this is not a lie. I'll never forget where I was. We were on the road for baseball. It was in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. If you've ever been to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, there's not much there in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, I'll tell you that. So we're, we're in the little Pawtucket. I had driven, so I had my car there. And I had, uh, it was the afternoon, so I had gone out to the store or something. I was just looking to kill time. It might have been the last game of the series. In the last game of the series, you get kicked out of the hotel at noon, so you're killing time until you go to the ballpark at 4 o'clock. So um, I was in a store parking lot. I got a call from the Blue Jackets, and I got offered a job on my 40th birthday. Huh. <laughs> I don't know if my dad had anything to do with that, but maybe. And he probably thought it was funny if he did. Um, but when I first came here, I came here as a color analyst on the radio. And again, not being a former NHL player, it's a, it's a weird spot. But I did pregame show, postgame show, the intermissions, and that's web video at that time, because this is now 2009, web video at that time was just starting to become more of a thing. So they wanted me to do a lot of web video and creativity, you know, coming up with content. And we call it that now. Back then, we were just trying to put something on, right? Now it has morphed into so much more. But... Um, I did that for four years, and then my partner I was working with, he retired, and then I moved over to the play-by-play -play chair, and that's where I've been ever since. So I know it's a long story, but throughout the story, there are, you know, like everybody's story, there's ups and there's downs. There's, uh, you know, if you, don't, if you don't persevere, and some days it's going to feel like the end of the world, and some days you're going to think, I can't do it. And those are the days that you have to... You know, just kind of put your head down and, and continue to go through. And this is the thing that I would tell you, you know, about this business. And maybe you picked up on this, maybe you didn't. But I'm listed as a radio play-by-play -play broadcaster. But there are so many other things that I have to do every day. It's not just that job. I mean, it is doing the web video. I do a podcast now um, for the team. It's a team podcast. It, what we've done it. Over the years, ever since we started it, it started as a video podcast, and then we took it to an audio podcast, and now it's a combination of the two, and we've done it five days a week, and we've done it two days a week, and we're constantly trying to figure out what the best, where we get the best feedback from the fan base. You know, what are they paying attention to the most? Um, so there's that. There's, there's just... You can't be locked into one thing. What I tell people all the time is, if you want to be in this business, and I'm talking about broadcast, media, you know, social now, all of these things, the keys are you got to find a way to get a foot in the door. If I don't take a job as a mascot, do I ever wind up being a play-by-play -play guy in the National Hockey League? Maybe, but maybe not. I wouldn't have been in the same circles. So again, it's not the likely path. Don't think that the likely path is the only path. And don't be closed-minded and be afraid or unwilling to try something. Because one thing you're going to find out, you're going to try some things you didn't think you would like, and you might love them. You just might love them. But you don't know until you try it. 
Now, in this day and age, what we've been going through for the past eight months or whatever it's been now, feels like eight years, this pandemic stuff. I mean, this is, this is even more, th this brings all this stuff even more to the forefront to me. Because not only do you have to be willing to, uh, to do things differently, you have to do things differently. It doesn't matter if you're willing. I can't do player interviews anymore one-on-one -on -one with the player standing right in front of me. I can't. It's gone to Zoom. Back in March, if you think I knew anything about doing a Zoom call, <laughs> you're wrong. I didn't even know what it was. When somebody said something about <laughs> Zoom, I said, we are talking about Zoom, right? Now I don't live without Zoom. Zoom is my life in some ways. I've got a makeshift studio in my basement now. I do all my work out of my basement. But throughout the months where we were not playing games from March until August, we were still putting out regular content, interviews with players, uh, shows, uh, you know, interviews with players from all around the NHL. And it all came across Zoom. My studio's got a green screen for crying out loud. I don't even show my house. I don't want to clean up. I just put a green screen down in front of it, right? But the green screen can put me wherever I want to be. I got some of the coolest Blue Jacket stuff hanging on my walls that aren't actually hanging on my walls. And I can change it, and it's, it's different, and it's fun. Um, but it's, it's about making adjustments. And it, it, especially now, it, it's so easy to, to get frustrated, so easy to get down. It's so hard to do what you want to do. It's so hard to, it's hard to network now. Networking is such a big part of this business, no matter what kind of work you're doing in the business. It's about, you know, my grandmother used to always tell me, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, in my business, there's a lot of truth to that. And there's a lot of truth to it because so many people know each other and they trust each other. Like I said, that first baseball job I got, I didn't even know the guy that called and offered me the job. But he trusted the guy that sent my stuff to him. And the guy that sent my stuff to him didn't hire me for the job that he had, but he trusted enough that I would be good for that job. And by the way, the job that he had was a number two job. He helped me get a number one job. Thank him very much. I was <laughs> pleased. But he thought I could do that. So he had that trust. And how do you get that trust? You've got to create that trust. And you create that trust by working hard and by being a good person. And those sound like such simple and silly things. But I tell people this all the time, and especially when I talk to high school kids. I really try to hammer that home because you don't think of that when you're that age. When you start getting older, you start to figure things out a little bit and, you know, how to play the system here and there. Listen, I'm going to tell you, I came out of small town western Pennsylvania. I never thought that I would be doing this. It was a dream. And it was the hard work. It was the perseverance. It was making contacts with people, treating them the right way that got me to where I am. You know, in today's world, sometimes people say, well, it's not true. If you, if you say to me, you can be whatever you want, you can do whatever you want. You just have to put everything into it. You, you have to try. And there are some people that say that's not true. No, it's true. It is true. I, I'm an example of how true it is. I used to tease my dad all the time and say, man, if you would have lived your dream, you would already be in this business, and then you could just have somebody hire me. Thanks a lot. You didn't do that. You know, it happens with my kids. I, my you know, my oldest is 19 years old now, and he has spent his entire life around a hockey rink or a, or a baseball stadium. And right now he's training. He, he wants to become a Major League Baseball player. Will he? I don't know. But I'm not going to try to squash his dream. You know, he's, he's going to a place to train to do that, and, and I'm going to let him try to attain his dream. I would be the biggest hypocrite if I were to look at him and say, no, you can't do that. I know you can't do that. You've you got to figure out something else. My mother told me once upon a time, don't get a job in radio. You'll never make any money. She doesn't say that anymore. <laughs> so in this business and going to this school, take in everything. Learn everything you can. Just because something might not be in the area that you're interested in, 
doesn't mean that you won't learn to have some interest in something. You know, here in Columbus, our sports emphasis program, I think there are people that have found out that they enjoy running cameras. They enjoy working on a production crew. And maybe when they came, they didn't think about doing that. Maybe they thought about making music videos or doing podcasts or, you know, and all of a sudden, hey, if I can do a podcast, maybe I can do a show. Hey, doing a show is not too bad. Maybe I can do some play by play. It all morphs into each other. But again, it's about what are you willing to do? What are you willing to put into it? How much are you willing to power through the frustrating moments and the frustrating times? Because if you can get through all of that, and if you can keep your nose to the grindstone, if you can work hard, if you can, you know, just show people who you are and have those people want to be around you, so much of a key. So much of a key. I don't think any of us that have ever hired somebody, and whether you're hiring somebody to, to pay them or whether you're bringing somebody on for a, uh, for a project that you're doing on your own, do you ever go out and say, you know what, I'm going to go get that guy that I can't stand or that girl that I can't stand. I'm going to bring them in to work with me. No, hardly ever. You hardly ever do that. So you, people want to be surrounded by other good people and people that are going to you know, work hard and, and think like them in many ways. So you got to find ways to get into those circles. By the way, I will bring in somebody I don't like if they do a good job, <laughs> right? If they do a good job at what they do, sometimes you bite the bullet and you say, okay. But if you're in charge, you say, listen, you're not doing any of that. We're just going to do this. But no, in all seriousness, it's, I mean, that's really, it's really what it's all about. It's really about what you put into it and what you want to get out of it. And the days where it feels like quitting is easier... You can choose to do that. But I always said, and I said it from that time I went to Kinston. I told you I was driving to I don't even know where I was going. But I, what I knew at that time was, if I don't do this, if I don't take this job I got offered, if this is really the dream that I said that I wanted to achieve, and it's being offered to me, and I turn it down, am I going to be able to live with myself from here on out? Am I going to spend my whole life saying, what if I would have done this? What if? I didn't want to live that way. No desire to live that way. You know, not when it came to my job anyway. Not when it came to trying to achieve a dream. And the last thing I'll tell you is, I've already told you you've got to get to know people and and you've got to, you know, get yourself networked in. I'll tell you another really, really big key. The people that are you that you are around every day, your family, your friends, you need to find the people that support your dream and you know what you want to do. And maybe it's just maybe it's one person. It doesn't matter. Just that one person that you can go to on those days you're ready to quit. On those days where it looks bleak. That one person that says, now nah, come on, you're better than that. One person that you can send your demo to. And have them look at it. The one person you can send those pictures to if you're, you want to get a, you want to do something in photography. Somebody that will look at that and give you honest feedback. Somebody that will listen to your podcast. Somebody that will watch your vlog. Somebody that you trust and somebody that is going to be there to back you no matter what. Because those are the people you're going to need in the darkest moments of this business and of life. So it's just another extension of life. Find those people. Have that support, work your tail off, and good things will happen for you. Any questions on the chat? Yeah. All right, what do you got? All right, this one is from Kimberly Frazier. So I can find where it went. Mm-hmm. I shall ask one from Chris Barnett, who is a student at the school. Uh, what, sh- what would be the option when you graduate from Ohio Media School because they want to do play by play? Uh, in color commentary, what would be like the first step they take to get into that after they graduate from Ohio Media School? Uh, in the play-by-play, you've got to figure out first of all what sport do you want to do, and where can you find? Uh, you got to find a place to do it. Again, if it's baseball, there are a whole bunch of minor league teams out there. If you just want to start, you're probably not going to the Columbus Clippers to start. Okay, 
you're, you're going to go to a lower level. Maybe the Dayton Dragons, which is single A. You know, you, you've, got to, you've got to be willing to start at the bottom and work your way up because the chances of starting at the top are very, very slim. And I'm going to be honest with you. When I, when I go to work now, and, I go, and I'm talking about going to work in the office with just uh, business people or ticket people, there's so many of these young people that get out of college and they're working in the NHL. I don't care if you're making a little bit of money or I don't, I don't care where it comes to that. You're working in the National Hockey League and then maybe they're unhappy about the money that they're making or, or they feel like they feel it's an entitlement to be there. I spent almost 20 years waiting to get there. I don't want to hear about entitlement of it, right? Appreciate where you are and understand where you are. And in a play-by-play -play situation, you're going to have to pay dues. When I worked in Syracuse, it's one of the, the best broadcasting schools in the country, right? And, um, and it was funny because I didn't interact very much with those people at all. I did, I did more on-air work in that town than any of those, those kids, but... Then again, I see them calling college football games on ESPN every weekend now. <laughs> a lot of them that were students at the time. But I remember there was a guy that was, um, he did play-by-play -play for football and basketball there. His name was Mark Johnson. And he had to teach a class as part of his job at Syracuse. And I remember he told me, he goes, I tell these kids all the time, when you get out of here, you better be ready to work in Boise, Idaho, not work in New York City. Because that's how it does work. You've got to start in a smaller market. So figure out what sport it is for you. Again, baseball is the easiest one. Hockey's easy because there are a couple level of uh, minor leagues, you know, in hockey. Case in point, the, the team in Cincinnati is an ECHL team. Toledo is an ECHL team. That's a step below the American Hockey League. It's, it's, it's essentially a double-A level. Um, you know, when it gets into basketball now, these G League teams are a way to go. Uh, if you, you know, you just got to reach out and contact people. You've got to... And with social media today, it's so much easier because find people like me, uh, find people that are in the business that have gone through it and, and pick their brains. And why you want to do that is because you want to hear their stories to get ideas, but you also want to develop a relationship because if, if something comes up, you want to be able to call them. Maybe you want to ask them to make a call for you. I do it all the time. I mean, you know, if there, there are people, and if I'm gonna if I'm gonna make a call for somebody, I've got to know them. I've got to trust them. I've got to make sure I'm I'm giving a good reference to somebody. But there have been people that I've talked to, and I've, you know, developed even if it's a small relationship with, that if they have an opportunity at a job, I'll call and recommend them. In the sports business, in my business, that you know, usually you give a resume and you have some references on it. In the sports business. Man, you better be calling people and asking them to call for you. That's how it works. Because once a person gets three calls recommending the same person for the job, they start to go, well, maybe this person's okay. I gotta look at that. So that's what you gotta do. You've gotta you gotta figure out what sport you want to do and then um, get into the development level of it. You know, college sports, you know, ESPN Plus is a good uh, is a good example of this. Uh, a lot of these schools now, like OU, they're hiring the announcers to do those games. So that's something else to look into as well. Some of the smaller schools like that, um, to contact them and, and see what they do and you know how they go about hiring for that. I know a guy that does uh, university at Buffalo. Um, you know, and it's it's just about sometimes it's just about calling and trying to find out. And and again, like what happened to me, sometimes you develop a, a relationship and that person doesn't have a job or that place doesn't have a job, but they know somebody that does. So they can recommend you on to that next person. I did find Kimberly's question that we got a couple in-house. Uh, Kimberly is actually trying to get into the voice acting business. Any suggestions on where to start? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? That one is, uh, that's a good question. And I'm, that, that's not, I don't know what to tell you because I thought about that too. And I don't know where to go with that. Uh, but. I'll tell you what, if I was, like, if that's something I was really going to do and I really wanted to do, uh, one guy that I know I would reach out to is Greg Murray, who is the public address announcer for the Blue Jackets, because Greg has his own production company, and I know he voices a lot of commercials. Uh, you hear his voice on a lot of TV commercials, especially car dealer commercials in central Ohio. Um, so he's a guy, 
like I would call him because he's a guy that would have those kind of contacts. Um, I don't have the contacts in that industry, but th that's really, <laughs> it's really kind of what my job is in this though, right? I mean, I don't know, but I know to call him. So, you know, it's like I told you my dad used to do maintenance. It's funny. I don't know if my dad could have fixed the doggone thing, but he knew who to call to get that thing fixed, right? <laughs> and, and it's the same way in my business. If you ask me something, you know, about like the play-by-play -play question, I can tell you exactly how you need to approach that. The voice acting, not so much, but but I do know that Greg Murray is a person that is, that's kind of in his realm and that's in his field. And, um, and he'd be a good person to ask about that. And I'm sure you can look him up on Twitter. I know he's on Twitter. So I would reach out like that. You know, as much as social media can drive me crazy these days, it is still such a great thing as far as, like if you want to reach out to somebody, um, now you don't know if they'll get back to you or not, but when you call them, you don't know if they're going to answer your message or not. But it's, it's such a convenient way to, to reach out to somebody and try to make that contact and get it to where you can make the call and actually talk in person. So utilize that, you know, look, and look around for... You know, just do a search for voice actors. Do a Google search for actors and agencies and then get on social media and maybe try to find some of these people and try to reach out and, and contact them. That's that's really that's where I would start. I would start with Greg personally, but then the next step I would would uh, take would be to just to do that and, and try to figure it out. Sometimes and, and maybe it's more once you've been in it for a long time, you start to uh, go through stuff and you see a name you recognize or somebody you know that's in that field that you had no idea was in that field. So do your research on it. Yeah, question up here? Yeah. Yeah, um, I heard you say earlier about uh, being passionate yes. and uh, getting some experience and paying dues. Well, um, I just wanted to know, uh, in your opinion, do you feel that uh, from the start of your career to now, have you become more passionate or do you feel like you become better? Or were you more passionate in the beginning and you feel like maybe, I'm not going to say lost some luster, <laughs> but do you really feel like uh, you got better in your career or uh, do you feel like uh, you're more passionate now than uh, the beginning? Or uh, how would you put that? Where you, where you feel like you're at right now? That's a really good question. And as you're asking me the question, I'm thinking about that in my head. Um, I, I do think I'm more passionate, and I think I'm more passionate for, for several reasons. But the biggest one in my business is when I'm in the minor leagues trying to get to the top, I'm always hoping for one of the guys at the top to fall somehow, some way, right? Um, you know, whether they retire, whether they get fired, whether whatever happens. So now when you're at the top, now everybody's coming after you, right? So if you want to get comfortable and if you want to think I made it and you want to let that attitude show in your work, you're just almost inviting one of these more passionate people to make an impression on somebody that employs you. And they say to themselves, you know what? That guy is really hungry, and oh, by the way, I can probably get him for less money than I'm paying this guy that seems to have lost his luster. Okay, so that's one thing. That's one thing. Um, but the other thing is the way that this business has changed. Like, if I was doing this job in the 1980s, I could probably just roll in, do the game, roll out, and that would be my responsibilities because that's the way it was. But now, as I said, you got to do the game. You've got to do um, the web video features, interviews, got to do a podcast. There's so many different things you have to do. And I don't mind that because I like doing different things. I like doing different sports. You know, I've done plenty of high school uh, football and basketball. I've done college football and basketball. Sometimes it's fun to go do that stuff because if you do get in a rut or if you do lose any luster, you, you go back and it kind of brings you back to life a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, I've been doing high school football here in Columbus for the last couple of years with Bishop Hartley High School, where my son went. And it is, I enjoy doing it for a couple of reasons. I really like the people there. And that's why he's graduated and I'm still doing it there. I, I like the people, but to me, it's a reminder of where you came from. You know, I when I first started doing high school football, 
we were, uh, actually, this is a funny story. I remember going to a place, we did a Saturday afternoon game, and it's because the place didn't have lights. And we went, this was an old, like, wooden press box. We had to climb a ladder straight up to get into this press box. I had to clean all the bird droppings off of the daggone shelf to be able to set up the equipment, right? This is a long time ago. And... This year I did the uh, I did the Division Three state championship game, and I was doing it on TV. But we went up to Massillon, and the the booth we were announcing on, out of was on the roof of the stadium, and they kept telling me, "Well, you got to climb up a ladder to to get up there." And I'm like, "Oh, big deal. You got to." No, this thing was unbelievably straight up through a chute, and it was like ridiculous, and it but it flashed me back to that other time, all those years ago. And it, to me, it's always like a reminder of, remember the work that you had to put in to get to where you are now? And that's what doing the high school stuff does for me. It's, it's much smaller scale, but it reminds me of, it's, it's the passion that you have for this is why you do it, right? Because I'll be honest with you, the job that I have is like any other job. I have bosses, it's a business. I think it's the greatest job in the world, but there are times when I don't like that I have to do this thing this certain way or, you know, my boss has told me this and, and I, I don't want to hear any of it that day. Th those things still happen. You're still human, right? But it, it's those types of things that is just a good, to me, is a good reset and a reminder of why you're here. Uh, so I do think I'm better today because I, I do more things today. And I also know that you have to continue to stay cutting edge today if you want to stay in this business. So you can't relax because somebody will pass you up. And that's why I think I'm better today than, than I was when I started. And I'll tell you this, this <laughs> when I, uh, the first baseball job I took, when I came back home and I did high school football that fall, I remember my dad saying to me, your voice sounds different. I said, what? He goes, it just sounds more developed. Well, yeah, I just done 144 baseball games in 154 days. I was talking all the time, which before I wasn't talking like that, right? So you develop along the way, and, and you've got to get better along the way. Because like I said, there's, there's always people nipping at your heels, and that's, that's going to be the same no matter what you're doing. I mean, let's, let's say um, you're doing something and you have a, a contract job with a company doing websites for them, right? And all of a sudden, there's somebody else that maybe their websites are a little bit better, or maybe they want to come in at a little bit less cost, or whatever the case may be. If you kind of feel like you got it, and and you lose any of that passion whatsoever, you're almost begging them to take the contract the next time it's up and give it to this person, right? So it's all, to me, it's all the, it's the same in every aspect of this. And, um, you know, it's hard to say you can't let up. I mean, there are days you have to give yourself a mental break, but you can't let that turn into, you cannot be in a comfort zone. Can't be in a comfort zone. Last question from the stream itself. Uh, what is the weirdest thing you've ever called in your career? Oh, the weirdest thing that I've ever called in my career. That's a really good question. Um, I've done some... First time I was asked to do... This isn't necessarily weird, but the first time I was asked to do lacrosse. I knew nothing about lacrosse. I was in Syracuse, and um, they called me... Colgate was playing Navy in lacrosse. And at the time, Navy was number three in the country. I didn't know. I didn't follow it. So uh, they needed somebody to do a lacrosse game. They asked me to do it. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And I said I'd do it because the guy that was going to do color with me, we did high school football together. And I knew he was a good guy. And I knew he knew a lot about lacrosse. And when I got there, I said, dude, you've got to carry me for the first half until I figure out all the terminology. And then we'll go from there. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is Colgate ends up winning that game that day. It becomes like this instant classic in Syracuse, and they're running it. Like years later, people would come up to me and go, hey, I saw that Colgate uh, Navy game that you called. That was great. It's like four years ago that game was called, right? So it was really weird because I didn't know a doggone thing about it when I started. I was, I was printing off stuff off the Internet, reading rules and all this stuff and trying to figure it out before I got there. Um, Women's field hockey is another thing that's really, first time I did one of those, they called me and they said, uh, can you do this game between Syracuse and Penn State? I'm like, yeah, 
absolutely. Well, that's going to look great on a resume, right? I mean, at that time, I hadn't done much big college stuff. Lady I was working with, I did ice hockey. I didn't do field hockey, so I, you know, I'm again, I'm getting through it. And the lady that was doing color with me, she starts quizzing me during the game, asking me questions. And I'm getting them all wrong. <laughs> she, uh, can you hit the, the, the ball with just one side of the stick or both sides? I go, oh, both sides. No, that's wrong. Just one side. Great. Awesome. Well, <laughs> just suck that credibility out of me right in the middle of this show. Thank you very much. Um, what else have I... <laughs> What else have I called? Uh, I did I did bowling once, which was fun. It was fun, and I wasn't drinking beer, so that was weird because that's usually what I do when I go to bowling alley. Um, so those things were all fun. Uh, one of the greatest things uh, this isn't a weird thing, but one of the greatest things I got to do the year that I got here, uh, the NHL was going to the Olympics, and during the NHL Olympic break, my old team in Syracuse was playing an outdoor game. And they asked me to come back and call that game. And it was like 20,000 people at the fairgrounds in Syracuse. And it was, it was awesome. It was, it was cold as hell, but it was fun. And, uh, and that, that's one of the, you know, doing the NHL playoffs is awesome. Being in the Stanley Cup playoffs and, and doing that is awesome. But, you know, getting outside of that, that, that outdoor game, that was still a spectacle. And I, that's still something that, like every year pops up on Twitter where they'll tweet out, remember this on this date and this and with a call. So it's uh, kind of weird. But as far as weird stuff, um, oh, I, when I got here, in one of my first years here, I had to take, I had to go with Rick Nash to, I think it was CD 101 at the time. So that tells you because they were 101, 1025, now they're 92.9. So this was a long time ago. It was after the Olympics because... Canada had won a gold medal, and, and Rick was on Team Canada. And I remember we met there in the morning, and he was just wearing a hoodie. And so he's, he's in there doing the interview, and uh, the guys ask him, you know, oh, did you bring the medal? He goes, oh, yeah, I brought the medal. He just reaches into the pocket on his hoodie and whips out a gold medal. Like, you know, like, <laughs> What? That's how you brought that here. <laughs> I don't know what I expected for him to wear it around his neck and parade it around. I don't know. But, um, but after that, they were playing uh, table hockey. Now, this is a radio broadcast. They're going to play table hockey against Rick Nash, and they asked me to call the table hockey game <laughs> while he was playing. And then Rick asked me to hold the medal. So I was holding a gold medal and calling table hockey. So that's probably the weirdest thing that I've ever called. But again, it was a great memory. And really what that's that's what this is all about for me. I saw uh, we went to Sweden uh, 10 years ago now for crying out loud. We opened our season in Sweden. And I saw this sign, it was just on the street. And and it said and I took a picture of it because it was so right and it said life is about the stories. And the one thing that I will appreciate to my dying day is the stories that I have from doing what I do. When I'm done doing this, I won't miss the game. I mean, I, to an extent. But what I will miss is the people that I've met along the way, the places that I've been able to go. We went to Sweden. I didn't pay. They sent me to Sweden, for crying out loud, on a charter flight across the Atlantic Ocean. It was great. I would have never went there on my, on my own by myself. Um, so the people that I meet, the places that I've been able to go, the friends that I've made, and oh, and I'll tell you this about that. I spent all those years to get to the major league level. And from the time that I've gotten here, which has been over a decade now, from the time I got here until now, I still tell those minor league stories sometimes more than I tell the ones in the past decade because they just meant so much to me. And and, the people, and there's other people like me that I worked with in the minor leagues that are now working at this level. And when we get together, we still talk about all this stuff. The Pittsburgh Penguins, their head equipment manager and their head athletic trainer, they were both with me when I was in Johnstown all those years ago. And we still talk about how we used to meet at the rink and get on the bus, and the bus would go up to the players' apartment complex and pick them up, and we would stop at the sheets and get hoagies and... Uh, chips and all this junk to eat on the 
four-hour bus ride to Columbus to play against the Chill. You know, we, we talk about that all the time. I work with Jody Shelley, who uh, played a long time in the National Hockey League, but he played in Johnstown when I was broadcasting there. And then he played in Syracuse when I was broadcasting there. I mean, I've known Jody for 20 years, and and now he does what I do. And it's, you know, he's it's great because when he was first getting into this, he leaned on me a lot to learn how to do this. And, you know, he was he was a tough guy, hockey player. And it was great at what he did. And now he's coming to me and not being sure of what he needs to do. And now he's a great TV star here. And I'm, and I'm glad I was able to help him do that. But we still tell the minor league stories all the time. We talk about going to uh, Toledo and leaving Toledo. And it was an ice storm. And the bus driver say, or the head coach saying to the bus driver, Frank, you sure we're going to be able to get there? Oh, yeah, we'll get there. No, actually, we were leaving Dayton and going to Toledo. I beg your pardon. Leaving Dayton to go to Toledo. Get on the interstate. We went about 300 yards. That's how icy it was. That bus stopped. We couldn't move. And all the players had to get off the bus, and we had to help push that bus off to the side of the interstate <laughs> and walk all the way back to the hotel and get them to let us recheck back into our rooms. Or the time that we went to Huntington, West Virginia to play on a Monday night. We were supposed to play in Richmond, Virginia on a Wednesday. And we were supposed to go home after Huntington, which was stupid. Because going from Huntington to Richmond would have been a lot shorter and make more sense. But the ownership of the team didn't want to pay for us to stay in the hotel the extra night. So we go to Huntington, and we get done playing. And I pack up all my stuff, and I'm trying to hurry to get to the bus because, you know, they might leave without you if you don't get there in time. And I go down, and everybody's just sitting down there in the loading dock area. Well, the players had made a deal amongst themselves that if they won that game, they were going to tell the coach, we're not going home tonight, and if we do, we're not getting on the bus on Wednesday and going to Richmond. So you have to make a choice. <laughs> so, lo and behold, I didn't pack for a three-day trip, but we took a three-day trip because we stayed in Huntington, and we went on to Richmond. And we stayed in Huntington, and one of my favorite stories, that equipment guy from uh, Pittsburgh now, and he was there. He and I had to go to a laundromat in Huntington, West Virginia, right in downtown, and wash the players' uniforms <laughs> while they were practicing on the ice before we went on. So there's, I, I can tell you a million great stories like that. I can tell you great NHL stories too. But it's, it is about the journey. So whatever journey that you're on, put your all into that journey and embrace those moments because someday – you're going to tell those stories, no matter what it is that you achieve. You're going to tell the stories of how you got there. And you want those to be fun stories and great stories. So don't, don't miss anything. I found out once I got here that there were a lot of things that I should have appreciated more on my way here that I didn't. I appreciate them all now. I didn't know. I was too focused on getting there. And you've got to be focused, but... Take it from this view to this view. Take it, take it a little bit more along the way because it's worth it. All right? Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being there. Thank you for your questions. Again, I hope you learned something today, and I hope you take it and put it into uh, whatever you want to do in this business because there are plenty of opportunities, and you can make your own. Thanks.